Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm happy to have you with us today. Uh, the title of my talk, as you know, is Finding Father Finn. But as one of my uh, Jesuit conferences said to me this morning, that's wonderful, you're looking for Father Finn. I didn't even know he was missing. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to begin, however, by thanking Anne Reichost, uh, without whose generous assistance this simply would not have happened today. Anne, thank you very much. <laughs> Say Ann Davis. Sometimes her name is mispronounced Davies. But <laughs> is that right? Yeah. yeah. And there was no longer here today. My talk will be divided into a number of parts. I'm going to talk about Father Finn as a writer, an author, and then Father Finn as an educator, administrator, then Father Finn as a pastor and social apostle, and then Father Finn and his relationship to St. Xavier College. I'll be talking about Xavier College and not Xavier University for one important reason. We did not become Xavier University until 1930, about 18 months after Finn died. So this will be a talk about St. Xavier College. And finally, I'll talk about, Saint, about uh, Father Finn, the person. But let me begin with a little biographical information about Father to put the talk in context. Father Finn was born in St. Louis, Missouri on October the 4th, 1859, just before the outbreak of the Civil War. His parents were John and Mary White Finn, and they had been born in Little Town called Bolinus Low, County Galway, in West Ireland. In his autobiography, Father Finn describes his parents as poor, famine-stricken immig Irish immigrants. He had two sisters, and we have a picture of one of them. This is his sister, Teresa, who remained in St. Louis, lived her life there, and was a librarian for many years. Father also had a brother, a brother Louis. We have a picture of him as well. His brother Louis moved to Los Angeles uh, as a young man and lived out there and had a family out there. Father Finn, for a few years, attended a private select school in St. Louis. But in 1869, at the age of 10, he entered St. Louis University. Oh. You might say, what in the world's going on here? At the age of 10, going to St. Louis University. Well, the fact of the matter is, St. Louis University was called a university in 1869 because it had a medical school, a good medical school, and I think maybe at that time a law school as well. But the fact of the matter is St. Louis at that time was no more than a six-year high school. Uh, they took in young men about the age of 10 or 11, graduated them at the age of about 17 or 18. This was the Jesuit model of schools that came from Europe, a six-year pro six program. It was a liberal arts program with emphasis on the languages Latin, Greek, and English. But one thing that Father Finn learned in St. Louis, which he was grateful a lifetime, he learned to be a voracious reader. Even as a young man, he loved to spend hours reading, novels mostly. He loved Charles Dickens and William Thackeray and Washington Irving and people like Nathaniel Hawthorne, members of the books over and over again. He claims that he read Nicholas Nickleby one of Dickens' novels, at least a dozen times. His parents thought he read too much, and they were probably right. That he was neglecting his other studies, and they were probably right, but there wasn't a whole lot they could do about it. Until one of his Jesuit teachers, Father John Gravel, once said to the parents, oh, let the boy read. Maybe he'll turn out to be an author. However, in his fifth or sixth year at St. Louis, there was a bit of a crisis. At that point, he was giving serious thought to entering the Society of Jesus, becoming a Jesuit. But he heard the rumor that one of the high-placed Jesuits at St. Louis University had doubts about his suitability as a Jesuit. And the Jesuit was quoted as having said, well, Frank Finn, is a nice young man, but he just doesn't have the brains to be a Jesuit. <laughs> I'm sure my Jesuit brothers here are delighted to know that he takes brains to be a Jesuit. <laughs> anyway, that's In a bit of a panic, 
Father Finn, young Frank Finn at the time, consulted with a Jesuit whom he admired a great deal, Father Charles Coppins, who was the director of the society at the time, and told him about this problem. Well, Father Coppins calmed him down, and he said to him, Frank, the problem is this. You're neglecting Latin. You have to know Latin, and this got all over the school. You don't like Latin. So I'm going to tutor you in Latin, and I'm going to do something else. I'm going to give you prayer books in Latin. I want you to read these. Which he did. They are a reader. He read these books and read them all again. <laughs> well, it worked. To the, at the end of that particular academic year, they had a competition in Latin, as they do in all Jesuit schools. And to everybody's surprise, Frank Finn won first prize in the competition <laughs> and got a special award at commencement. And he says in his autobiography, needless to say, that's the only prize I won at St. Louis. <laughs> but in July 1877, he did enter the Jesuit division. I think we have a picture of him. He entered the Jesuit novitiate uh, at Florissant in, in uh, Florissant, Missouri, and uh, uh, really a suburb of St. Louis. He didn't really travel all that far from home. The novitiate is really a two-year program where young men find out whether they are really suited to the Jesuit way of life. It's a time of prayer, it's a time of reflection, during which, among other things, the uh, young Jesuit makes the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius for 30 days, which uh, Father Finn did under the direction of a very saintly man, Father Isidore Boudreaux. However, after 14 months in the novitiate, it became clear he simply could not go on because his health collapsed. So he left the division for a period of time, hoping to recover his health, which he did apparently. And he came back to the division in March 1879 and took his vows in March 1881. In 1883, he was transferred to Woodstock College. This was the Jesuit philosophy and theology for the United States at the time. Uh, it uh, is located really in the suburbs of Baltimore. And in his day, at the time he was there, it had a rather fine reputation. Because of political upheaval in Europe, a number of rather notable Jesuit theologians were exiled from Europe and actually settled at Woodstock. So it was a rather distinguished faculty. But that really didn't help Frank Finn a whole lot because his health was precarious once again. However, during the first year there, he did something interesting. He wrote three short stories, which he was rather proud of. But the fact is, his health collapsed again, and he was, uh, simply could not go on with his studies, and he was sent by his superiors to a Jesuit boarding school in Kansas, St. Mary's, Kansas, where he was going to teach and prefect. And that's what he did. He says that when he got to St. Mary's, Kansas to teach in the fall of 1844, he was a physical wreck. That's the way he described it. But the three stories that he had written were his pride, and he decided to do something. He showed the three stories to a rather eminent Jesuit professor of rhetoric at St. Mary's College. He thought maybe the stories could be published, so he gave them to a father, William Kinsella, rather noted Jesuit at the time, who had authored actually a book on rhetoric used in the Jesuit schools. Father Gonzalez was very unimpressed. We don't know exactly what he said, but we do know what Father Fien heard. And it was something like, my advice to you is to give up all idea of writing for publication. There's nothing in your work to show that you will ever make an author. <laughs> well, poor Father Fien was again from the crush really crushed over this, and decided that's the end of his writing career. At least that's what he says in his autobiography. I'm not so sure. Because several weeks later, in November of that year, an interesting thing happened. He was sitting in class with students. He was sitting at the teacher's desk. The students were out there, and he had just assigned them a composition, which they were writing. And it occurred to him, as he looked out in that class, why don't I write a story? about the students sitting here in front of me. This, these students, these high school students. Write a story about them. Make the base uh, of the plot this very school in which we are. So I took a piece of paper, got a pencil, and started writing a story. 
the country story, fast as he could. At the end of the period, he had this story, and he read it to the students, and they loved it. Absolutely, they loved it. He was suffering from a great deal of insomnia at the time. And so, as a result of their enthusiasm, he continued to write this story at night. Frequently not able to sleep till about 2 in the morning, he was writing more and more stories. And he told the students, he said, if you're good, and if you study hard, I will read for you at least once a week another chapter of the story. Well, they loved it, and that is how Tom Playfair, his most popular novel, got written, uh, really through that period of time. He, as I said, was in bad health, but nonetheless, in 1886, he returned to Woodstock College uh, to begin to re resume his philosophical studies. He was there for two years, and then in 1888, between uh, philosophy and theology, Jesuits normally teach for a period of time, and he was sent in 1888 to Marquette College in uh, Milwaukee, today Marquette University. And he taught there for two years. I think, Ann, we have a picture of him. I can't see. Is that uh, him with students? Mm -hmm. Yes. This picture is of Father Finn with students, and I think this is probably Milwaukee, somewhere around the year 1888 or 1889. He returned to Woodstock in 1890 to begin his theological studies, which he completed in the year 1893. And in 1893, he was ordained a priest. I think this is, yes, this is a priestly ordination, pre-Vatican II, incidentally. It's a picture from a later period, but it is an ordination, and it is in the chapel in which Father Finn was ordained uh, at Woodstock College. Notice how many people are being ordained there, by the way, by the number. The picture itself dates from about 1940. <laughs> But it gives you an idea of where the ceremony took place. Yeah. He was ordained by Cardinal James Gibbons, uh, who was a noted uh, <coughs> figure in the Catholic history of the United States, a very important person. I thought he was the first man appointed cardinal, but that's not true. Cardinal McCluskey of New York was the first, but he was second. There's an interesting story, and I'm going to just digress very briefly to tell you. The story is, and I don't know what is true and what is not true here, the story is that Cardinal Gibbons was invited to Cincinnati by our alumni to speak at our alumni banquet around the year 1890. The story is that he came and spoke. One of the morning newspapers the following day talked about this wonderful speech that Cardinal Gibbons had given in which he reminisced about the wonderful days he had spent as a student at St. Xavier College in Cincinnati in 1855. And that the years in passing have not effaced these wonderful memories. One of my predecessors as archivist has a little note under this little story. There is no evidence that Cardinal <laughs> Gibbons ever attended St. Xavier College. <laughs> so, but we do know this much. Whether ever he was here as a student, he certainly or ordained uh, Father Ken in the year 1890. <laughs> But it's interesting, during these years when he was at West Woodstock and also in Milwaukee, he wrote some of his best books, probably his most prolific uh, part of his career. Because in 1890, he published Percy Wynn, which I think may have been his favorite novel. I'm not 100% sure, but that's a feeling I get from reading what he said. The following year, he published Tom Playfair, the, the book they did written at St. Uh, Mary's. And the same year, Harry D., another very popular book of his. And the following year, a fourth book, Claude Lightfoot. They were immensely popular, popular. And Tom Playfair was actually translated into about 10 different languages. It, 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 it was not only popular here, but throughout the world as well. And so by 1893, when he was ordained, he was a rather well-known literary figure. And we'll go on, if we could. In 1897, he was assigned to St. Xavier College here in Cincinnati. And I think there's, I can't see it, there, but there should be a picture of it. And this might take, uh, let me just talk about the building for a moment. 
On the left, of course, this is 1897 now. On the far left, yeah, on the far left is St. Xavier Church, pretty much the way it is today. It was built in 1859. It was consecrated in January the following year, 1860. It was devastated by a terrible fire in 1882, which is an interesting subject in itself. Rebuilt and rededicated 13 months later, and as I say, pretty much the same church today. The school building that you see there was uh, the college to which he came. Now this was located on the west side of Sycamore Street, between 6th and 7th Street. And the school building itself was built in three sections, three parts, over a period of about 24 years. On the far right here, which is where 7th Street would come in to, was the Jesuit residence. That's where Father Finn would have lived. The school building is between the residence and the church, and that's where he would have taught. He taught for four years in what was called by that time the collegiate department of the school. But his health failed him again and he left the teaching really for good. In 1901, he was appointed associate pastor of the church, but more importantly, he was uh, appointed the director of the grade school. And again, I think we have a picture of that here. This is St. Xavier Parochial School, grade school. It was the parochial school of the parish that you just saw. It was also on Sycamore Street but it was a block down toward the river. It was between 5th and 6th, and it was on the other side of the street. And uh, the time that he came it was a relatively new building. It had just been built in 1895. In 1904, in addition to running this school, Father Fiat established what he called the St. Xavier Commercial High School for young ladies. and was uh, operated in the very same building. And it was a wonderful idea. This was an opportunity for young ladies having finished grade school to train for work in an office. They were in all kinds of secretarial skills, typing, uh, bookkeeping, and so forth. Very popular, and it remained in existence until 1960. In 1913, he did research, once again resume his, re his writing a little bit, but his last years, his health was failing very badly last three years of his life. And uh, Father Finn died in Good Samaritan Hospital here in Cincinnati on All Souls Day, November the 2nd, 1928. His autobiography, a very important work, was published posthumously the following year, called Father Finn, the story of his life told by himself for his friends, old and young. That's a rather long, but that's my simply a biographical, biographical introduction. I'd like to talk now about Father Finn the Rare. Father Finn published 27 books. For a sick man, that, that's really remarkable. Most of them were novels for young men and young girls, adolescents. But he also wrote plays, religious skits, other things that were performed by the children in the school. And he also edited for many years the parish calendar, the bulletin of St. Xavier Church. And it was popular. People picked it up. It was always fresh and interesting. Sometimes you might have a book review or some new book on a saint, life of a saint, or maybe something on prayer, or perhaps the review of a movie. He loved movies. But people loved to read his work. But it was his novels that were most popular. What was his secret of success in his novels? Well, I think maybe I can summarize it this way. First of all, he knew his audience. He wrote for adolescents, and the, the subject of his play, of all his books, were adolescents. He knew them, and he, understand them, he understood them, and he loved them just for what they were. His stories were full of action. There were, there were a lot of adventures, the type of thing that would appeal to a younger person. But his characters were real, and his, his, his readers could identify with them, and, and did. But also he wrote in the lingo, the language, the slang of the students, and caught their attention as well. But at the same time, in his novels through, throughout, <clears throat> pardon me, throughout, there was, a, it was very, very clear that you run a Catholic institution. All Catholic practices and devotions were made very, very clear. And of course, there was always a strong moral. 
But Fien felt a moral was necessary. It appealed to the idealism of younger people. And that was part of his appeal. He was really, in many, many ways, a pioneer. There was really nothing else in the genre quite like this. And that's, I think, added to his popularity as well. And I think we have a couple of pictures there. Um, yes, this is a picture of Tom Fifield <coughs> in his first edition in 1891. And this is Tom Playfair in Dutch, one of the ten translations of the book that was done. But let me read for you, if I may, what some of the critics said about his books. I think this is interesting. This has to do with Claude Lightfoot Manol. Father Finn's characters are real and very human. Sometimes they're bad, sometimes they're good, but they're always human. Or another critic wrote, there is humor and pep. Okay, thank you. This is another critic. There is humor and pathos running through every line of Father Finn's works, but a shade of dullness never. <laughs> this is an interesting one about Percy Wynn. I have read and reread Percy Wynn, and I am going to read it again. <laughs> of all the books I have read for the last 40 years, None has given more, more genuine pleasure than this beautifully written little book. Almost every page makes one laugh and cry at the same time. Another critic. These stories were written primarily for children, but we see no reason for keeping them out of the hands of adults. <laughs> they, are for all, they are for all children up to the age of 90. <laughs> Another interesting review, and, and this is uh, of his book, The Fury of the Snows, which was published in 1913, a bit later. Review said this, is it really one form of a common illusion that we think Father Finn's latest book is his best? It seems to us that The Fury of the Snows has greater depth, emotionally and intellectually, than Father Finn's other novels with a surface humor, richer, happier, and more tender. The critics. But there were a few who had some doubts. And this is interesting. And I think we can move to the next. Before Father Finn had published anything at all, back in 1887, he submitted Tom Playfair to Father Provincial of the, Chicago, of the uh, Missouri province. This is, I think, this is Father Rudolph Meyer. Incidentally, a rather important figure in the history of the Jesuits in the Midwest, a man who played a very big role in the formation of Jesuit education around here. But at the time he was provincial, it's in 1887, and Father Finn sent the manuscript to Tom Playfair to have it approved with permission to publish. This is the very first book. Father Meyer liked the book, complimented it in his return letter, but he had one proviso, and this is interesting, this, Father Meyer, to Father Finn. I would suggest only a few changes in the rather slangy expression of your little heroes. They are indeed very natural, just such as boys would use. But a college is supposed to correct at least the more glaring vulgarisms, or if you weigh it well, boy talk or lingo. Introduced into a beautiful composition like yours, they are more likely to become more general instead of being corrected and avoided by your readers. <laughs> I have a hunch Father Finn never observed. <laughs> but even more critical, the Carnegie Public Library of Washington, D.C. refused to put Father Finn's books on their shelves. This irritated the editorial staff of the Baltimore Catholic Review who in a public op-ed piece in their publication wondered out loud, why is it that the Carnegie Public Library of Washington, D.C. does not have any of Father Finn's books? All the other public libraries do, Pittsburgh, Cleveland, Boston, Philadelphia, New York, why not Washington, D.C.? Well, Washington, D.C. public library was a little bit irritated. This wound up in correspondence between the two of them. And finally, the uh, director of the library at Washington put it this way. He said, Father Finn's books 
are not of sufficient literary merit to justify our acquisition of them. It was a minority opinion. But there's one, one other interesting item that it struck me. How is it that a person so sick could write so much? Well, years later, Father Finn attempted an answer of this in an article he wrote. This is from about 1922. This is what he says on that subject. Looking back, there was one thing that strikes me as very strange. Tom Playfair is my liveliest book. It's full of animal spirits. And yet, I wrote it an invoice. During this composition, I was sinking in health, suffering from mental depression, from physical pain, from want of sleep, and although, although not especially perturbed, looking forward to an early day. I discovered that to write, however, a book, one need not feel well or cheerful. A writer can give what he has not got. My own analysis is this. I think the fact of the matter is he found writing therapeutic. It helped him. It, it took his mind off his pain and off of his suffering. I think that it really was part. And it certainly filled up those many hours of insomnia. It's interesting that in his autobiography, he really doesn't explain his illness all that much. There are times when he describes severe back pain. There are other times when he talks about respiratory problems. And one is a suggestion that perhaps he suffered from tuberculosis. But I don't think that was true. He certainly suffered long periods of insomnia. <laughs> but we know this, that he was once diagnosed with Bright syndrome, Bright disease, which as I understand it is a disease of the kidneys. And we also know that he died of chronic nephritis, which is also uh, maybe the same disease of the kidneys. So I think kidney problems probably played a very major role. But whatever the story, uh, he was a very sick person, much of his life. To move on now to Father Finn as educator and administrator. And I think we can change pictures again. Are we back to our... Yes. Eyes must have rolled, and a few um, sighs must have been uttered. When people found out in 1901 that Father Finn had been appointed the director of the parochial grade school. Because it was a huge school, 1,500 students at the oh. time. And it was failing. It was in very bad shape. But here was this sick person who couldn't teach anymore. This person's only accomplishment was writing fairy tales for children. So he made an administrator of one of the largest schools around. But it worked. And it's interesting how it worked. As he says in his autobiography, the school had two things going for it. First of all, a brand new wonderful building, this building here. And number two, wonderful teachers. The sisters of Notre Dame de Namur taught the girls, and the brothers of Mary taught the boys. And as Father Finn said, I have a wonderful faculty, and they came at a very, very good price. <laughs> but he was proud of them and proud of the work, but it didn't solve his other problems, which were severe, and namely financial problems. To understand this, you have to understand how poor St. Francis, St. Xavier Parish was at the time. Yeah, I think the next one. Yes. This map will help to you for you to get a better idea uh, of what the parish was at the time. St. Xavier Parish is really just off the map at the top here. You can see the Ohio River, and you can see just about everything else, maybe east of Sycamore. Now that area today is occupied by I-71, Fort Washington Way, Great American Ballpark, U.S. Bank Arena, Aitman's Cove, uh, Sawyer Point, Bicentennial Palace, all that. Take all of that out of your imagination and put in its place old, run-down, overcrowded tenement buildings, almost all the way down to the river. That was St. Xavier Parish, and that's what he had to deal with a great deal of pre-stark poverty. And he was running a school for these children. The, most of the people in this area would have been Irish, very poor Irish, very recent immigrants. But others as well. There were 21 different nationalities in the school uh, in 1904. 
So it, it was pretty heterogeneous and uh, it was made up, as I say, mostly the children of immigrants. The Germans moved elsewhere in the city because of their language background. They moved to, over the Rhine or to the Western area. But this was what made up St. Xavier Parish at the time. It was called the Bottoms. The Bottoms were in the city's lower area. And of course, as I mentioned, the school was huge as well. Well, how did Father Finn succeed in dealing with this? Well, as it turned out, he was a rather shrewd, savvy, savvy businessman. And he went about it rather cleverly. Working from his reputation, the fact that people knew him well as an author, he gathered around himself a group of laymen, and they were going to help him pay for the school. And with their help, he set up what he called the St. Xavier School Association, a rather prestigious title for a great school, but that's what he called it. And he described it this way, and I'm going to quote now what he publicized in the stationery of the St. Xavier School Association. Its object to give free schooling to the children of the parish. Its means, contributions monthly or yearly from members, conditions of membership, payment of at least $3 a year, or if you could afford it, $100 a year but your perpetual membership for the living or the dead. And the benefits were two masses said for the members every week. This worked. He gathered the money that he needed. He made the school free. He became the first free parochial school in the Archdiocese of Cincinnati. And eventually, he actually endowed the school. And money really never was an issue, in that <coughs> thanks to his business ingenuity. Now to talk maybe a little bit about Father Finn, the pastor and the social worker. Uh, and I think we have another <coughs> This is a very interesting picture. I think it dates from about 1918. You can see Father Finn in the front row there, in the middle. I believe he's in the middle there. I can't see it myself. But the two people in the back row are also significant. On the left-hand side, as you look, there is Father Joseph de Smet, who was pastor of St. Xavier Church for a number of years. Much love. On the other side is Father Michael Ryan, and I really want to find out more about uh, Father Ryan. He ran for many years what the parish called its free, free day nursery. It operated a day nursery for all the children uh, of the parish. It was operated in what became the uh, rectory of the church for many years. It was just to the south of the church building. And that free day nursery went on for years, absolutely free. The statistics indicate that on occasion there were as many as 100 children going there every day. And it was run, for the most part, by the sisters, no to named in more again. The man in charge for many years was Michael Ryan. There's a wonderful story in his obituary. It said that Father Michael Ryan said the early mass at St. X every day. But during the winter, it's like this, before he said his early mass, he went over to the free day nursery and built a fire in the furnace for the children so that the building would be warm by the time the children and the sisters got there. One of the unsung heroes, uh, we have that name, Michael Ryan. But Father Finn also became an apostle throughout that parish, as did all the pastors, and, did, and also the non-Catholic pastors as well. <coughs> but to give you a good idea of what he did, I'd like to tell you the story about Mary Bowling, because this is a story that came to light just a few years ago. Mary Boland lived here in Cincinnati. She was at the Maple Knoll, Maple, Knoll, Maple Knoll Village Retirement Center. She was 90 years old, and in the year 2006, she contacted us. And Kathleen Keller, who is with us today, was the one who received the phone call. And Miss Boland had this information. She said, I have in my possession two letters that Father Finn wrote to my mother, Blanche Barrett Bullet many years ago. Would Xavier University like to have these letters? Well, Kath Ann knew we sure did, and she went and got them. Well, the letters are wonderful, but the story behind it is even better. And this is the way Mary Bowen told the story about her mother, uh, um, Blanche Barrett Bullet. When Blanche Barrett was 15 years old, 
She and her siblings were living in the bottoms, the basin, where we just saw a picture of. They become, became orphans. Their parents died, and Blanche Barrett decided that she was going to take responsibility for her siblings, and she was going to take care of them and set up a flat in one of the tenements for them. Under the supervision of two maiden Irish aunts who lived nearby, but not under the same roof, because they were too bossy. <laughs> so that was the setup. But Father Flynn did not like this arrangement. He was, he was concerned about it. Every Saturday afternoon, Father Finn visited Blanche Barrett and her siblings, usually bringing a couple of bags of groceries with him. It worked. She was able to maintain the family, and in later years, when one of her younger brothers uh, contracted tuberculosis, spunky young lady that she was, she decided to take her younger brother out to Tucson, Arizona, to see if some kind of a cure could be effective. One of the two letters that Blanche Barrett uh, received from Father Finn is during that period when she and her brother were out in Tucson. And the letter is cute, it's about this big. And it reads, Miss Blanche Barrett, Tucson, Arizona. And she got it. There must have been a lot of people in Tucson, Arizona in those days. With a two cent stamp as well. But Father was known, Father Finn was known for his work throughout the bottoms and um, one of the Cincinnati newspapers featured him in an article at one point. In that article, one gentleman, simply identified as a Jewish gentleman, had this to say. He said, to do good is Father Finn's religion, and that's fine with me. A Protestant gentleman quoted in the same article said, Father Finn is a prince of the church of good hearts, and I try to be a member of that church in good standing. But perhaps even more to the point, the Reverend David McKinney, retired rector of the First Presbyterian Church of Cincinnati, had this to say of Father Finn at the time of Father Finn's death. I quote, No man was better known in the basin of the city than Father Finn. I came into contact with him numerous times while doing charity work in the lower sections of the city. He was especially kind to the little ones and his death will be felt keenly by many youngsters. What a tribute to Father Finn, and incidentally, what a tribute to, to the Reverend McKinney as well. Father Finn was very active in what was called the community chest. Uh, Roger Fortin says in his book that he helped to found the community chest in, here in Cincinnati. Community chest still, ex still exists, but now it is called the United Way. There's a rather interesting letter in our archives. It's a letter that Father Finn wrote to the parents of the students of the parochial school. And then he said that he hoped everybody would support the community trust, the Randall Drive. It wasn't Catholic, it wasn't denominational, but they did wonderful work for the poor and the needy. And it was his personal wish that every student in the school, the great school, <clears throat> would contribute at least one penny to the annual uh, collection. And uh, they did cook up an election every year. Uh, and an indication to uh, the kind of person he was. <clears throat> I'd like to talk now about Father Finn and St. Xavier College. As I mentioned earlier, he came to Cincinnati in 1897 in order to teach at the college, which he did. He taught in the what was then called the uh, Collegiate Division, Collegiate Department and also in what they called at the time their postgraduate program, taught, taught literature courses. But again, his health failed him, and he then moved on to the work in the parish and the grade school. In 1913, he did help the college to establish its school of journalism, which it had for a number of years. For his most important work for the school was done as a member of the Board of Trustees. He was appointed to the Board of Trustees, first of all, I think, because he was regarded as a very wise person whose advice was really solicited on every occasion. And it's clear he exercised influence. When the Jesuits were trying to decide whether to move the school from downtown out here, move the whole school out here, maybe move part of it, but one of the people they really consulted was Father Finn. His opinion counted for a great deal. Of course, we know. I think they all may want to wait for a little bit. 
Yes, maybe they move on to the next one. I think. Yes. Yes. We all know, of course, that Father Finn is responsible for naming us, giving us the name of the Musketeers. You might wonder how that happened. Well, in 1925, the school newspaper, the student's neighbor, the uh, Zaverian News, decided to hold a contest. This was in the spring of the year. And the contest was this. You were invited, everybody associated with the college, to select, to select a name, recommend a name. What should the athletic teams be called? This was the point where football was becoming a rather big thing. We had just built the stadium across the street on Victor Parkway. The football team was doing very well, and it needed some kind of mascot. And so this contest was designed to find an appropriate mascot. Well, in the fall of the year, the student newspaper announced the decision. And then I think we can move on. Yes, you can see the headline there. I can't read it myself. Trustee selects the name of the uh, college. Can you read that there? Well, that's what happened. The winner of the contest was none other than Father Francis Finn, and he recommended Musketeers. His reason for recommending it was precisely their slogan, their, their, their slogan, all for one, one for all. And uh, it was accepted, and we have been the Musketeers ever since. That was the work of Father Finn. But something I realized only as I began to do a bit more research he was always also very much involved in fundraising. I didn't realize that until just a few months ago. And maybe if you just turn to the next picture. Yes, oh yes, this is a picture. I can't see it. That supposedly Father Finn is in the background there. Yes. In fact, that's he with the football team. And that would have been out here, because the football stadium at the time was out here on the campus. And this, yes, this is a picture of Ellet Hall. It's a rather, a rather interesting story behind this. In 1924, Saber College just completed building its first dormitory, which was Ellet Hall. Perhaps some of you did not know it was the first dormitory here on campus. And this is a picture of it. In 1924, the question came, what should the building be called? What should we name it? Well, there's an interesting exchange of letters between Father Bronco, who was president in 1924, and his immediate predecessor, James McCabe, who had just left the year before. McCabe knew all about this building. He had helped to put it up. In a letter from McCabe to Brockman, we have this interesting comment. In regard to the name of the dormitory, I believe Walter Leibold suggested the Francis J. Finn Dormitory. Unless Finn demurs, I think that should be the best name, as he has done so much to raise the funds. I never knew that. Uh, a lot of the fundraising for this building was the work of uh, Father Finn, as it was, I suspect, for other, other buildings and other projects. But it's also interesting, yet, if we move on to the next picture, four years later when the Schmidt Fieldhouse was dedicated, this is the Schmidt, the same topic came up, what should it be called? What should we name it? In a letter to Father Brockman, the chair of the athletic department, or the athletic board, wrote this, and I quote, Father Finn, as you know, suggested the name of Musketeer, and I feel and believe that the athletic board feels that Father should, Finn should be properly memorialized by naming the fieldhouse the Francis J. Finn Fieldhouse. That never happened either. But it's interesting the thinking of people. Finally, let me talk about Father Finn, the person, because I think this might be the most interesting. Miss Florence Moran, who was the secretary for Father Finn in the grade school for many, many years, made this remark. Father Finn never grew old. He loved children, and children always came first. And they loved him in return as only children can do. He went, seems to have had a very amiable, affable personality. Unpretentious, unassuming. As one person said, there wasn't a conceited bone in his body. But he was, beyond any doubt, a highly spiritual man. It was clear that his faith in God 
was what both motivated him and helped him to carry on the work that he did. And belonging to the generation of Irish that he did, he was intensely devoted to the Catholic Church uh, because he knew what his ancestors and his parents had suffered to maintain their Catholic identity. But for all that, he was well known and universally admired throughout the civic community, the business community, the religious community, and the education community of Cincinnati and indeed beyond. But in the preface to his autobiography, I think Father Daniel Lord puts it rather well, why he was so genuinely loved. And I'm going to read this paragraph, even though it's a bit long. Father Lord, I shall never forget the first time I walked with Father Finn down the streets of Cincinnati. It was a new and startling experience. Here was one man who didn't need money at all. I had just got off a late train, so we dropped in for lunch at a restaurant. We ordered, ate, the proprietor came up, spoke to Father Finn, wrote his initials on the check, and that was that. <laughs> we took a taxi cab, and the driver did not pull his meter flag. We approached a motion picture theater. The manager ran out, greeted Father Finn effusively, and begged him to come in to watch the latest feature. People stopped him on the street to press money into his hands. Money not for himself, but for his many, many charities. All told, it was something new in my life, a day that proved to be one long tribute to Father Finn. At the time of his death, the tributes came in and weren't quite touching. The mayor of Cincinnati, Mr. Murray Seasonger, had this tribute, and I'll quote, I feel the city has sustained a very great loss in the passing of Father Finn. I was a personal friend of his, and a great admirer. He was a man of a lovely nature. Personally, I feel his death came in. William Cookins, the executive vice president of the city, uh, Cincinnati Chamber of Commerce, wrote this. Father Finn did as much or more for the young people of Cincinnati as anyone I know. I cannot tell you all the good he has done for our city. I feel a great personal loss. Michael Crane of the Civil Service Commission said this, I quote, Father Finn was one of the greatest Jesuits of his time. I have never known a religious in whom the active life and the contemplative life were so beautifully blended. I have lost a very dear personal friend. About a week after Father's death, a gentleman by the name of Ron Mulford who identified himself as simply Presbyterian, wrote a letter of condolence to Father Brockman. Uh, and he said, I quote, on several occasions, Father Finn and I found each other on the speaker's table at a banquet. And among my fondest memories are the kindly tributes he paid to me. Once at a father-son dinner given by the Knights of Columbus, Father Finn expressed the hope that he would meet me, his good old Presbyterian friend in heaven. I certainly find myself today echoing those same desires. Father Finn, as I mentioned, died on All Souls Day, uh, November the 2nd, 1928. I don't know how common it was at the time, but there were actually two funeral masses for him. On Monday, the Monday after his death, there was a Requiem High Mass celebrated at St. Xavier Church. It's a picture of Father. Uh, yes. There was a, a Mass celebrated uh, in St. Xavier Church by Father Hubert Brockman. I wanted a picture of him. He celebrated this special Mass. And uh, incidentally, uh, Brockman Hall is named after Hubert Brockman another one of the heroes in Xavier history. This particular mass, however, was for students and children only. And the guest list included the students from St. Xavier College, Liberal Arts, the College of Law, the School of Commerce, which was the evening school, 
St. Xavier High School, the Xavier Commercial School, the young ladies, and of course the children from St. Xavier Parochial School. That mass was just for the children, I suspect it's the one he really appreciated. The following day, there was a, a pontifical Requiem High Mass, which was celebrated by His Excellency, the Archbishop of Cincinnati, John T. McNichols. And there's a picture of him here. They say it was the largest funeral in the history of St. Xavier Church, at least so far as anybody can remember. One woman who came mentioned afterwards, she arrived 45 minutes early, but the best she could do was standing room in the vestibule. <laughs> There were dozens of uh, honorary pallbearers mentioned in the um, obituary. And uh, there was no eulogy at the time, though at the end of the Mass, Archbishop Nicholas paid a brief tribute to Father Finn. We also have a picture of his obituary card there. Take that and look at it as well. Father was laid to rest uh, in St. Joseph's New Cemetery in Price Hill. Can you play, find uh, any place better to be buried than <laughs> <laughs> Shortly after his death, the Cincinnati Post, uh, I think, summarized Father Finn very well in an editorial tribute to him. And I'm going to close with this. This is from an editorial in the Cincinnati Post. Father Finn's heart embraced mankind, and Jew and Protestant, as well as Catholic, were his kinsmen. The Catholic called him Father. The Jew called him Father. The Protestant called him Father. In deference to the loving kindness, the gentle voice, the mellow wisdom that were his distinctions. Yet he was withal a most human, human being. Tolerant of the weaknesses of people and seeing good in the best of us. There is much written about his merits as a writer of books. But the Reverend Francis J. Finn will be remembered best by his qualities as a noble gentleman. Mm -hmm. Someday, I hope somebody writes a biography of Father Finn because he deserves it. And maybe a fitting title would be Francis Finn, a noble gentleman. Mm -hmm. Could you think of a better uh, mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.